Um, hi, so good morning, uh, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's just a chance to take you through quickly some of the new features in IOGAS 7.1. Um, pretty informal presentation, mainly because I'm running it. Um, and if you like, if you want to try and ask a question throughout, uh, then feel free to unmute yourself and, and butt in if you like. Um, if that doesn't work or if I don't notice it on the way through, then I will stop uh, at the end of the presentation so that people um, can ask questions. Um, so it's Dave Laurie here uh, running the presentation, but also uh, Putra Sadikan, who's living in, uh, sorry, who's listening in from Melbourne, um, has also been key in putting this content together, uh, especially, you know, you'll see when we take you through the, uh, the part which pre-records a lot of the functionality. Um, so what's new in IGAS 7.1? So that um, that graphic there, which you now use, the new version of GAS shows off some of the new features actually, which we'll have a look at uh, in some detail shortly. Uh, and just looking at that, there's a few things there uh, which, are, which are notable. One of them uh, is the wavelet tessellation analysis, uh, the picture on the right, uh, rows diagrams and the structural analysis tool, um, a vastly improved way of storing and displaying user-defined planes and lines, and again, in the structural analysis tool. Uh, and I, the um, ability to make bar charts um, using attributes, um, rather, I suppose that's really an extension of the histogram tool. And a new type of combined plot there on the bottom left, which is a combination of uh, the box and whisker plots, uh, the scatter plot, and the automatic thresholding available in the box and whisker plots, which can be transferred onto the scatter plot, uh, which we call, for want of a better word, a scatter box plot. Uh, anyway, I'll show you how those work uh, in a minute. Um, so what are some of the high level things that we're doing uh, in IGAS 7.1? And as usual, I do refer you to the help file. Um, everything that's covered in this uh, presentation and more because uh, there are lots and lots of other smaller features in IGAS 7.1, are uh, all in the help file, and that should always be the first port of call when you have a question. Um, so there is the wavelet tessellation. We've added um, alpha beta conversion into dip and dip directions, uh, um, along with a, ho a host of other stereo improvements. Um, sorting and multiple selecting the attribute manager. People have been asking for that for about 10 years. We've finally put it in. Uh, similarly, uh, with displaying point labels on plots, uh, we'll have a look at that, the scatter blocks that I just mentioned. Um, the favourites tool list, so that's a that's a new addition to go along with the new ribbon toolbar, uh, just makes it a bit easier for people to use who weren't that familiar with it. Um, Carl Brohart's Osnaka um, database of reference rock compositions is now built into GAS, and I think that's actually a really, really cool feature. And I think people will find new and different ways of using that. Attribute charts, which I just um, commented on, and some other interoperability things. So even uh, just with an index, our new XRF fleet, um, we've made some changes to accommodate that. Uh, uh, and things with Sasha Ponchal's uh, company, Ospec, and the, her AI Sirius uh, program, uh, we have the ability now to take in uh, calculated features from IR uh, spectral data related to mineralogy and automatically classify that in a series of different diagrams which are now available in GAS directly. Um, now before I'm reiterating some of these points and showing them to you in some detail, I'm just going to Putra um, pre-made a quick run through of some of these but he goes he goes pretty quickly because he's very familiar with all of the features but I'll, I'll run this and then after that I'm going to jump back in and show you some of the more uh, important features uh, in real time, in fact, and just show you them being used uh, manually without the pressure of trying to make a video. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Putra, and this will just take about 10 minutes, but it really is a very quick overview of all of these new features. This is an overview video on some of the new features of iGAS 7.1. First of all, let's look at the interface. We've added window ban options to the quick access toolbar, which lets you now minimize and close all open plot windows. We also now have a pyramid list where you can create a menu of frequently used tools, which you can easily add to this list using right click on any tool icon. We've moved the save button and the file ribbon bar to be located next to open. We've added select labels to the data ribbon bar, added centered log ratio as a quick transfer menu option, 
and we now have a dedicated ribbon for structural tools. And we also now have the option to browse the logs folder for technical support purposes. In the select variables dialog, you can now sort the list of elements by right clicking on the list to the left. This list will be sorted by variable type and then alphabetically within each variable type. Median lines on two key box spots can now be displayed with a notch instead of a straight line running through the median. We've made some changes to the attribute manager. You can now click on headers to sort the items in the list alphabetically or by number of rows. And you can make multiple selections using the shift key on your keyboard. This can be used to easily merge multiple attribute groups together. You can also select multiple attribute groups and turn them on and off at the same time. And let's look at XY plots and some new improvements that we've introduced in this release. You can now change the size of mean crosses on XY plots. The size of mean crosses line can be one or two standard deviation for each color group. And we've also added QAQC guidelines around the Y equals X line in XY plots. You can toggle between displaying 5, 10, and 20% guidelines and all three lines at the same time. QAQC lines are also available in QQ plots. The 5, 10, and 20% guidelines can be displayed around the Y equals X line of the QQ plot as well. And we've also decoupled the regression line tool from the toggle to display the Y equals X line. As a result, you'll now be able to choose amongst different calculations for regression lines. A new plot type introduced in this release is the scatter box. A scatter box consists of a scatter plot in the middle with two box plots on either axis of the XY plot on its side. Outlier threshold lines, as per the two key box plots, can be toggled for color groups or for all data. You can then attribute data points that plot outside of these lines with unique shapes and sizes to mark them as outliers in your file. In this release, we have included the entire OSNACA dataset into IAGAS. I'm just going to open a classification diagram in order to display these nodes. The OSNACA dataset can be found within a new tab under the Mineral and Rock Composition tool. And the OSNACA tab itself is divided into sub-tabs for deposit types. And clicking on the reference button will bring up more details about each sample. The Osaka nodes work in the same way as rock reference nodes. And these nodes can be displayed in an XY diagram such as this one and in other plots as well. And if you wish to know more information about each sample point, you can now display a text label on top of each point. By default, it uses what you have set in your sample ID field, but you can change this to use the first variable in the select labels tool. To view what column is used for your sample ID column, you can now open the column of this dialog without closing all of your open plot windows. And the next new plot type that we will look at is the bar chart. The bar chart uses the color, shape, and size attribute groups in your file to display counts of samples within each group. And you can cycle through displaying between attribute types and see how shape and size attributes have stacked color attributes. With the latest provided resource update, we have been supplied with some templates and diagrams by OSPEC to use with OSIRIS spectral data. And this is a gas file from the OSIRIS cloud, which contains OSPEC spectral data. We can open one example of an OSIRIS classification diagram that we can use to auto-attribute our samples. In this example, the data points are colored based on where they plot within the calculated thresholds for the different chloride types present. Let's move on and look at some of the new features that we've added to the structural module. As mentioned at the start of the video, Structural Tools now has its own ribbon menu. And this follows from an IQ logger export and it contains alpha, beta, gamma angle readings. Our alpha beta conversion tool can take these measurements to convert into dip and dip direction values. And you'll need to know your drill hole orientation to configure the dialog accordingly. By default, it'll create columns called dip and dip direction if you don't have columns of that name in your file. And once you have these columns, you can now plot a stereo net. We have separated the structural configuration dialog from the plot itself, and setting save within this dialog is applied to any subsequent stereo nets. You can now place linear features on a stereo net where they appear as a different symbol to user plane poles. And we've revamped the user planes and lines dialog where you can change their visual properties and add new features from within the same dialog. There's also an option here to change how planes are displayed. You can display them as poles, planes, or as both poles and planes. So among some of the things you can do visually is now you can change the color of a feature and its size on the plot. 
You can also change the symbol that is used for each linear feature to distinguish between each plot of lines. All of this information can be copied between stereo net plots within each session or to a text file. All information within the dialog is retained when it's copied across, and you can copy both plane and linear features. Aside from user planes and lines, we can also plot user drill hole on a stereo net based on its dip and azimuth. User drill holes follow our convention in which a positive dip value represents an upward pointing drill hole, and negative dip value will represent a downward plunging drill hole. You can copy user drill holes between the stereo net plots. And we can now look at a brand new plot type, which is the rose plot. The rose plot is a way to visualize direction measurements, and it uses color attributes set in the attribute manager. The rose plot uses whatever is set in the structural configuration dialog, so it will display structural measurements along a 360 degree axis based on its dip direction. Structural readings are allocated to when a certain size and similar oriented features are stacked together in the same bin. You can toggle between showing only planar or linear data, and you can add or reduce the number of bins to adjust how many measurements are allocated within each bin. And you can cycle between displaying dip, dip direction mode, or strike mode. In this release, we have added support for applying Vanta detection limits to imported XRR files from Avanta. The CSV file is from one of our Vanta portable XRF machines, and the new detection limit can be found in the drop-down list in the importer dialog. The values outlined in this list are based from internal testing and index. The last major feature that we will show you in this video is the Wavelet Tessellation tool. This is a gas file containing data from an easy gamma. The file has depth information and gamma reading for each row. Go to the Analysis menu to open the Wavelet tool, and the initial setup is similar to a downhole plot tool where you first assign your whole ID and depth information columns to the appropriate fields. You will then need to assign a variable to use as the signal column, which will be the gamma column. Wavelet tessellation requires the data to be regularly spaced, and we provide the option to interpolate using a set depth spacing based on either half of the median or the median spacing. There's only one drill hole here, so just select and click OK. This will generate a scale space plot with the default view being a tessellated view of the wavelets. The blocks are colored by the mean variance for each group. And by default, the blocks are colored using a linear color ramp, but you can change this to log or percentile coloring modes. The tessellation blocks are displayed with a 30% noise filter applied to it, which we will discuss shortly. I can choose to display the regularized signal column or the original signal column, or turn them off altogether to see just the tessellations. Wavelet tessellation is an integration of two analytical approaches for processing complex signals. This is a heat map display of the wavelet transform of the gamma signal with an overlay of transparent tessellation blocks. The tessellation blocks are filtered at 30% by default, and pairing the filter size can reduce the complexity of the tessellation by merging the blocks at the lower scale. In a scale space plot, the blocks to the left of the plot represent small-scale spatial domains such as lithology units, while the larger-scale boundaries to the right might relate to supersequences or stratigraphic units. So going back to looking at the colored tessellation blocks, these are colored by the mean variance. And what we can do now is save the block tessellation mean values to the file by dragging the red line on the plot. You will see the scale and depth changing. Click anywhere to save the tessellation mean values at the scale. The resulting mean values column is a numeric column, and it contains the tessellation mean value for each block at the chosen scale, seen here plotted as a downhole plot. So what you can do now is plot your gamma signal in another downhole plot. And you can then use the attribute manager to select the tessellation mean values column to auto-attribute your data points. You can see how each row is colored to the tessellation boundaries identified for that particular scale in a scale space plot. Another way that you can select the scale to generate the tessellation mean column is via the sum of squares versus style counts plot. If you hover your cursor over each inflection point in the plot, it'll move the red slider across in the scale size plot, and the x-axis is the count of blocks at a particular scale. So here I have chosen a scale that will give me 20 blocks. 
And if you have done this workflow before and determined the filter percentage and scale required, it's possible to create the mean column without displaying the scale space plot. The batch mode allows you to type in the filter percentage and scale values and run the process for your selected grouping fields. And again, you can use the resulting column to auto-attribute your data points. Wavelet oscillation is a useful tool that lets you turn a complex downhole signal into an interpretable pattern that can be related back to the geology, allowing you to delineate any natural boundaries that may exist within your data. This concludes our brief video on some of the new features of iGuess 7.1. For further information, please see the full list of new features and improvements on our help file. And if you have any other questions, please feel free to contact us via our website. Right, and I think we're back. Uh, thanks, Pooja. Um, obviously, that was pre-recorded. There's one guaranteed outcome from running the webinar. Uh, now, after Pooja's taken you through that very quick uh, whiz through some of the, the new features, which, uh, although it was quick, it was extremely comprehensive, uh, I was going to take a, a, a slower approach to showing you some of the new features, I think, just so that, um, uh, that they can embed a bit more. Uh, but again, I remind you that everything that gets mentioned here is all available uh, in the IOGAS help file. Uh, now I'm going to be switching backwards and forwards a little bit between actually running GAS live, so expect the odd glitch, um, and also going back to the PowerPoint. Uh, so the first thing I'd like to pick up on is the wavelet tessellation, because that's actually quite a, a new and different feature in GAS. It's going to open a, a data file. Again, another gamma file. So, yeah, the, the tessellation can be applied to any downhole data, but of course, it, you know, it functions best with uh, data that's uh, collected in quite a continuous and consistent way downhole. So, we're using a geophysical log here, by example, a gamma log. Uh, but you know, if you had drill holes that had very had regular assay data collected downhole on on coherent intervals. Uh, then yes, it would, would absolutely work with that as well. Um, oh, well, I'll just pooch just to send me a message. Uh, don't use that one. All right. Whoops, it's me up a different file. Yes, okay, that's a better one. Uh, so there's, so I've just opened that up now, and that is actually a plot of the gamma base down hole. Um, we're just showing you one hole at a time here, just to keep it a bit simple. Uh, but the real power of using this sort of analysis is where you have, um, well, one hole's okay, uh, but when you have a group of holes or a fence line of drill holes, uh, it makes it, it really gives you a, a strong visual guide about how to interpolate or push boundaries from one drill hole to the next. Um, it's really, and some people don't like it to call this, but it's really an auto boundary picking uh, system. Um, if you like. Um, another thing I often tell geologists is, you know, this, this is a guide, it's not the, not the final answer. If you have a lot of logging to do and you run this sort of analysis, then maybe it does 80% of the job for you, uh, but then you can spend far more time at the core looking at the important features in the core which can guide your logging uh, in a much more effective way. Um, so there's the raw data sitting over there at the left, and obviously there's a few obvious boundaries in there, but let's have a look at the wavelet analysis. So into the analysis menu, into the wavelet tessellation. Let's move that out of the way. Uh, we've got whole ID depth, and again, as Pooch did, I'm going to pick the signal column, so gamma. Um, we deliberately call this a signal column just to make people aware that we're really looking at signals within drill holes, so we're just trying to emphasize the fact that um, consistently and coherently and sim very similarly spaced data collected down the hole is most appropriate in this case. Um, the half median is the interpolation we use to regularize the data. You shouldn't really have to change that very much. And I said, okay. I guess it's doing a bit of work. And here's the tessellation, as you saw earlier. Um, now, Putra was uh, uh, reeling off some of the complex descriptions of what this means. Um, I tend to think uh, of these plots when you're looking at them, uh, and here I'm just changing the colour ramp as described, so the linear percentile and log, um, and then the, the regularised data or not. Oops, I'm just waiting for gas to catch up. So there's the actual tessellations and the wavelets uh, behind it. Um, another way of looking at this is where you pick off where you want to set your scale. Um, 
in geological terms, you can either be a lumper if you're at this end or a splitter if you're over at that end. And obviously there's some sort of um, uh, middle ground here, but to guide you for a selection of what scale to use to try and pull out how you want to apply these, these domain peaks to the, to the geology or the drill hole you're looking at, and we've provided this plot. Let's click that in there. And if you look at this plot, it's actually quite, quite important. Uh, it looks fairly simple here because we're looking at one drill holes, but it does become more of this sort of a pattern when you have more than drill, one drill hole to look at. Um, if you click on the nodes, or if you hover the mouse over the nodes, um, it tells you what scale you're looking at there. So a scale of one is about where that red line is on the tessellation there, scale of one. I come over here and have a look at a scale. Oops, get the focus. Uh, scale of one. Uh, then it's telling me, uh, you know, that there's about a hundred boxes or a hundred intervals at that scale uh, present within the drill hole, and the sum of squares is giving you some indication of within each little box here how much the data within that box varies about the mean within that box. So. Uh, so that's sort of interesting. So the, if we go over to here, uh, for example, if we have a very small scale, so we're over on the extreme left of the wavelet tessellation, then we have lots and lots and lots of little boxes. So the data doesn't spread much from the median of the data within the box. But if we go over here, we have a scale of, um, um, again, I'm reading the, the scale of the data point, not off the graph, of 51. So right over on the right-hand side, uh, you can see if you've only got two Tessels picked out of that data, then the sum of squares of the data from the median within those two intervals is going to be very large. Uh, so it's a way of trying to guide you of what scale to use. It's a trying to guide you between that uh, splitting and lumping um, part of the interpretation. So I'm just going to go with, with a scale of about, I'm just looking at this, say, two. That's probably enough intervals there and click on that. Um, and now what it's going to do, once I've clicked on that and I've picked that scale off, in fact, I can set that back to the two right here directly. Um, I'm going to write into the file um, against all of the samples and I'm plotting down here uh, what the average value is within the tessel uh, of the data points within that tessel, if that makes sense. So I'm just going to hit OK. And that's OK. Uh, that's written back into the file now. So um, if I go into select that variable, and even if I look at a, oops, missed it there. Okay, now I'll make a probability plot, and there's a there's a probability plot of the values. Um, and if I go into the data itself, get across, and there are the values there. So you see. These are the different intervals that have been picked out um, between boundaries that have been automatically picked by the way of the tessellation process. Um, so that's all good. So I'm going to show you another way of um, using this data. I'll just minimize that and get rid of that. Um, and one way to, this, this is quite easy to interpret because we're looking at one drill hole, but if you've got masses and masses of data, then what we can do is actually run a one dimensional cluster analysis on the means that have been produced after the wavelet tessellation has been applied. Um, so into the analysis menu again. So this is a, an example of gas of concatenating um, a whole sequence of different types of analysis. So we go to clustering, we go to OK. Remember, it's not looking at the raw data now, it's looking at the groups of, looking at the mean data, which have been generated from picking that scale in the wavelet tessellation. Um, so if I was looking at this, I might look at this and look at, again, look at a sum of squares plot and think, you know, perhaps there's six real groups present in the tessellated data, those means. Um, so I'm going to pick six and hit apply. And now I have the data auto domained back into my raw data. So the boundary peaks, which I've worked out that I've wanted to use from using a particular scale, in the wavelet tessellation, I've then applied, then use the data generated by that, um, fed it into a k-means, then use the k-means to further subdivide that into simplified groups again. And then I end up with virtually a geological log over on the left here. If I zoom in a bit, 
Um, and if you just look at that, these things, and it's a bit her heretical almost for geoscientists, but these things just about always make sense. Um, and if you're just confronted with a mass of data and you're just wondering around that very first, how we're going to log this, how we're going to start subdividing this data up, this is an excellent start. Um, and what we've just shown you here is actually a very simple example of that workflow. Now, what you can do is if you had a project with many, many drill holes, you could just pick four or five, six drill holes, something you think are quite representative of the geology you're looking at, run this analysis in a few different ways until you find something that you think you're happy with. Then you can actually take the results of this, this sort of domaining, as you can see here, and then apply that to all of the other drill holes in the data set. Now, which is, which is an incredibly efficient workflow. And another way to think about that is that once you have this sort of colored domaining applied onto your data, um, if you're using something like Leapfrog Geo and the live link, then this downhole logging, domaining logging, whatever you want to call it, uh, then immediately becomes um, apparent in the full 3D context. So it's just, it's really, it's, it's quite a complex procedure distilled in gas into a very simple to use workflow. And I just iterate it again, have a look in the help file. There's a really, really good example in the help file that takes you through that workflow uh, step by step. Um, and, you know, this is the first time this has gone into gas in, in this version, gas 7.1. So we are interested in uh, any feedback you have on it uh, so that we can improve it as we move along into the next version. Um, so I'm going to leave um, leave the wavelet tessellation then and just move on a little bit. So don't say that. Oops, it's going to go into the demo data file here. You know, structure just again, just to point out a couple of things. Don't say. Uh, so here is the so the, the structure uh, menu or ribbon bar at the top there has a few new entries in it. And I know um, there's some new things in here at the request of some of the people listening here. So the alpha beta conversion tool uh, is now present uh, in IOGAS. Uh, the rose plot, so there we go. So we can be plotting up uh, dip and dip directions. But being gas, it's just not a normal old rose plot. It's always also split by um, the attribute manager, which we think adds a another level of use to it. Um, and the other thing which Butcher alluded to uh, when he was showing you earlier was the ability, much enhanced ability uh, for adding the user planes. Oops, sorry, I've got, the, I've got the control for the webinar because in front of the tools that keep popping up. Um, right, is to add um, user-defined uh, uh, planes and linear features. So I've got a stereo net sitting under there so if I had a dip of uh, 45 and a dip direction of 45, uh, call it Dave, and apply, and then if I come back, and you can see it here in the background. Um, then, so I've put that in there and then I can show it as a plane, pole and both, and there's the pole and there's the plane. You can have, have a whole sequence of them. And as Pupra said, you can copy them from here into another stereo note and have quite a few reference uh, planes and lines. Uh, again, their features we put in um, after a lot of people have asked them, asked us about that. Um, uh, and I'm going to go out of there. Of course, once you start using these new structural tools, if you have feedback, please get back to us. Um, just going back to the demo file. Uh, back into the demo file, so, and the attribute manager. 
so a couple of things that have been asked for, um, well, forever, really. Um, you can now sort in here. So you can sort with the names, sort one way, then the other, and the counts. I can go into geology. Uh, you can sort there, up and down. Uh, you can uh, multi-select and turn things off as a group. I think that's been a ticket in the system for about 12 years. Um, Similarly, I can do another multi-select with a shift click and click that and then get everything ticked again in one group. So they're just little um, uh, efficiency tools now which finally we put into the attribute manager. Um, another one, if I make these all visible again, and I come back to the, to the map view and open up the map control, um, is we can... Show labels now uh, on here. So um, if you have a label set, uh, then if you don't have a label set, it will show a sample ID, or you can go and manually set labels as well where you're normally doing gas and those labels will appear, uh, both in the map view and on the scatter plot. Um, of course, one, and you know, we know this is useful, but one reason we've not put it in uh, over the years is that if you have 50,000 data points on a small scatter plot and turn the labeling on, it's not a good look. Um, but we do know that there is a use case for it, so hence we, we have put it in. Um, the scatter box plot, um, I'm just going to go and select. So I've got zinc and nickel selected there, get rid of these things out of the way. Uh, into graphs, so the scatter box uh, sits here, it's on the ribbon bar there up by itself. Uh, so if I click that, I'll just make it a bit bigger. Um, and in fact, I'm going to go into the attribute manager and colors and clear all. Uh, it sort of makes it a bit easier to understand what it's doing when you clear that out a bit. Uh, and the shape, I'm going to clear all. Yeah. Um, so, you know, in a simple way there, it's just plotting the uh, nickel and things. This is a scatter plot. And there is the, the box and whisker plot for uh, for zinc up the top there and nickel over on the y-axis side. Um, giving you, an, I think it's, um, you know, if, you, if you're trying to teach people what's got, or what box and whisker plots, uh, why they look the way they do and, and why we use them, it's a good tool for that. Um, but the other thing we can do here is a really good use of the box and whisker plot is to extend them into the two key outlier analysis um, mode, which is what's being shown there within the box and whiskers themselves. So. Here's the background data. So you'll recall that 50% of the data are plotting between the 25th and 75th percentile. So the interquartile range on the, on the box and whisker plot. And then the, the two key statistics give us a, a rational reason for assigning an upper outlier threshold and a far outlier threshold in both of these variables. Um, so the concept here is it would be nice to transfer these thresholds onto um, the box and whisker plot Oh, sorry, onto the scatter plot that's in the middle there, and then further, of course, transfer that into some sort of a map view. Uh, so to do that, when the scatter box plot has the uh, has the focus, there are some new tools over on the right hand side here, and this one here called threshold lines. So I'm just going to click that. So I'm just going to go through that slowly. So no threshold lines. If I click it once, I'm getting the uh, the far outlier threshold, so you can see here's the far outlier threshold um, for nickel drawn across, and there's the far outlier threshold for zinc drawn down. If I click it again, then it shows the outlier. So this is a, uh, a more per permissive threshold, if you like, drawn down, so just above the whiskers there. Um, if I've done that, then I can actually click on this little outlier status button that and now it's updated the symbology on the map with whether it's a it's not an outlier in both using the outlier threshold from the two key box and whisker plots uh, whether it is in nickel alone whether it is in zinc alone and whether it is in nickel and zinc um, so uh, and the size so there's some more information on here this takes a while to digest this plot i've not even turned on the color groups uh, the size of the symbols also represents whether it's a an outlier or a far outlier in both dimensions, uh, both dimensions singly and together. And the shape 
the the symbol that we're using there is trying it's saying that it's pointing in this direction so it's trying to tell you that what you're looking at there is a outlier in both dimensions as uh, as determined by the turkey statistics so this is not a multivariate method it's a joint univariate method so it's just a quick way of summarizing uh, a lot more data in one go um, if i come back to the attribute map and then we can see here that the the attribution of course is carried through into map space and if you're getting lost looking at it of course you can turn on the uh, the little legend uh, which which is also gives you the which way the, uh, the symbols are pointing and then a description of what these things mean um, now that's just using the the data as is i can push this along a bit further if i come in to uh, assign a color group and this is when your brain starts to get a little bit bent out of shape but nevertheless the um the box and whiskers split as they do in the box and whisker plot um, and then the the uh, coloring splits in the scatter plot uh, that lies underneath it and then if i reset the the attributes now we have a a four different category so a four way category summary of a, of three of thresholds uh, by one element at a time and their behavior jointly and then all of this is propagated through uh, onto a map um, yeah maybe best to try this at home before you go and talk to people at work about it just to get your brain around um, how it's working uh, otherwise you'll start talking to it and get lost uh, but nevertheless it's a new a new tool in gas um, so just some other things while we're in here, uh, which got covered off before, but interesting to, um, uh, to think about. So if I was to go back, for example, to um, the scatter box, uh, if I was using it all the time, I can add it to a favorites menu. And if I come over to the side here, here's the favorites menu. If I click it, there's the scatter box. Um, now this, you know, this is in response to some people that were um, and, and I will say it's not many people, it's people transitioning from the ribbon menu over to the uh, from the classic menu to the ribbon menu. Uh, if you still manage to lose things in the ribbon menu, then the best thing to do is just by all means go and put them on the favorites menu. Um, and then then they're very easy to use. So we figure this is a for a lot of people, this is going to be very uh, important for them. Um, and virtually any tool that you use all the time can be added to the um to the favorites menu including uh things like diagrams that you might use all the time so it's not just different plots and statistical procedures uh, diagrams and spider plots and calculations those sorts of things as well uh, can be added into there um another thing here while we're at it is a lot of people say well the the menu the, the ribbon menu takes up a lot of room uh, when i'm trying to use gas where well, you can just quickly you can just quickly hide it uh, while you're working in here and then if you want it back you can bring it back like that if you want to um, preserve screen real estate um, so those sorts of things are, uh, are feedback from people since we released uh, have gone in due to feedback from people uh, since we released uh, version 7. Uh, then a couple of other things just to finish off um, let's the rest of the files. Let's move some windows around Whoops. Save that. Okay, very important. So here's one of our uh, pre can diagrams uh, that we ship but there's one thing in particular and this is some um, with the geochemistry it's the finland uh, public domain data set um if i come into our control box where we determine what what minerals and rocks we want to overlay on the diagram <coughs> excuse me um we have a new tab in there they're now called osnaka and this is the this is the database of of uh, coherently consistently analyzed rocks from various ore deposits from various deposit types 
uh, that Carl has collected or people have sent in um, from all around the world. So, you know, we've had this on the agenda to do for a while, but we've finally gotten around to it. Uh, so when you go into here, um, we've there's a lot of data in here. I think there's about a thousand rock uh, analyses uh, in this tab to use. Uh, but we've divided them up as best we could, and we've tried to include as much metadata uh, along with the sample IDs, the deposit style, uh, where it came from, the deposit name, things like that, so it makes sense. Uh, but you know, here here is the chance here to say, well, I wonder if my rocks look like uh, a deposit from blah blah, um, and especially powerful in plots like this. So this simple uh, sodium, aluminium, potassium, aluminium, aluminium. General, general element ratio graph is a really powerful plot for understanding alteration. Well, you can come in and overlay various ore deposits from around the world on here to your um, heart's content. Uh, so we think we think that is a, a really particularly useful addition. Um, but while you have those rocks uh, displayed on the diagram, um, if you're wondering what the metadata was associated with them, when you cycle through, there's just the sample ID. Uh, there's the deposit names, so there's, there's Telfer on there, for example, uh, Fort Knox, uh, then a one, another one, and then you get the category it's from, so intrusion-related gold and Telfer and the sample names, so they cycle through if you forget what you're looking at. Um, and I know you're probably thinking right now that, geez, it'd be great if we could get our own library of rock compositions uh, available in a tab like that to overlay in our data. Uh, that will be in IGAS 7.2. So the next release, that one was definitely uh, coming along. Um, while I'm in here, just to make another point, uh, just a nice visualization thing. Uh, go back to the graphs and I'll scatter box. Uh, and I'll log that. Uh, so the, the scatter, the box and whisker plots, they're always a popular tool in gas, always look um, uh, nice before. They look better again in version seven. Uh, but now we have the notched uh, notched box plots as well again. Uh, but look into the help file. Uh, this, these notches are a robust uh, test about whether the medians are statistically significantly different from each other or not when you're looking at various groups within a category. Um, they're not based on standard deviations and things like that, which are very misleading in geoscience. Uh, but again, if you want the details, uh, then dig into the help file. Um, some other uh, individual things uh, without delving into them in detail. It's going to bring up the PowerPoint again now. These are the things I've been showing you in, in gas itself. Uh, so just little things. So uh, with the RGB um, uh, point tool, uh, you've always had the ability to have variable cutoffs with uh, with the red, green, and blue channel based on percentiles, but not with the image version of that. But now that's available in the image version. This is a little enhancement. Um, getting back to the structural tool, um, uh, you know, there, there are, you know, for those of you that are dealing with structural data, uh, we very much uh, encourage you to get in and have a look at all of the new features that are in there. Um, they're all there uh, due to user feedback. So please have a look at these, and if you if there are more things you want in there, then just let us know. And as we as we go along, we we um, gradually uh, add add what you need into the software. Um, on the interoperability side, um, so uh, the mineralized guys with their core scanning system, they have the ability now to write an IOGAS uh, file directly from their system. So if you're using their uh, the mineralizer core scanner, then um, uh, that's an entirely logical thing to do to look at the data after the cores have been scanned. Um, uh, and similarly, uh, we can do that with Micromine now. And we've also built in, as Putra alluded to, uh, new templates for looking at the outputs from AI Siri, uh, which is the um, IR uh, decom the decomposition of IR data for automated uh, mineral ID and mineral chemistry ID as well. So I'm just going to jump out and show you where that is in gas. There's just a couple of plots. So if you have a look at the, uh, 
have a look at the data, it's the standardised output that the ACERI software provides. So there's all of these uh, scales or calculations that are derived from the spectral data. Uh, but now in GAS, if you go up into the, uh, into the diagram system and the provided, uh, there's an ACERI um, tab in there. And if you clearly wanted to pull out uh, the features that are in the data file, which are meant to be, which you meant to look at for the chloride chemistry, then it makes that diagram directly. And then if you come through and use the usual tools in IOGAS, you can attribute the points with the uh, chloride chemistry type. Um, and again, that could be linked through into other software like LeapFrog, Geo, et cetera. Um, it's, just a, it's just an efficient uh, workflow thing and we think it fits in within GAS very, uh, very well. Um, just another one here, for example, kaolinite crystallinity. Uh, there it is. So there's the pre-canned um, um, classifications for different kaolinite crystallinities based on the IR data. And then click the button, override it. Um, then of course, if you're doing multiples of these, you can populate different columns in GAS to preserve these classifications so that you can um, look at them elsewhere. Um, now back into... Um, and just getting near the near the end now. So the, oops, that one there, yeah, right there. Um, and Pooja alluded to this. So some, we know gas is not a QAQC tool, but we do know that people use it for that. So we've had some requests for uh, reference lines about a line of y equals x. So at, at you know um, at 1.05, 1.1, 1 1.2, perhaps just some lines um, like that as guidelines. Um, you know, with the caveat that you can only express error in one variable at a time on a scatter plot. That's why we resisted putting these, those sorts of lines on a diagram, like on a plot like this to be used for QC, but it is a visual guide. I'll give you that. So fair enough, they're there now. Um, and the other thing we have there is the ability to illustrate the spread of, two, of, that, of the data on the plot uh, with crossbars, which have different, um, uh, which have different settings, but here, it's just illustrating the mean and the standard deviation of the data by color group. Um, um, just a couple of other things there. Um, uh, so I showed you the show hide ribbon toolbar. Uh, restore all open plot windows, things like that. Uh, easier to find the labeling tool. Um, the variable selector, now I'm not going to show you that, but um, a lot of people have asked if within the variable selector tool if you can just sort them alphabetically, and you can now. Um, and another one, which I know frustrated some people, is when you were doing a principal components analysis uh, in GAS uh, and you had the report on your screen, but then you saved the file and walked away. When you brought it up again, um, the report had gone. Well, that is now saved in the workspace, so it no longer disappears. And that's it uh, for now. Oh, there's another 10 minutes left or so. Um, if you wanted to ask any questions, uh, feel free to do so. I'm just looking at this window. Uh, there is a question, um, there is a question panel in here. So if you want to ask some questions now, uh, please do so. I'll, if you type them in, I can answer you um, by voice. And if not, we'll wrap up and I'll go and get a copy. I will say that, so this webinar has been recorded, uh, warts and all, uh, but it will be made available on our website later. So if you've got other people at work that you think would like to have a look at it, it will be available later on for them to watch uh, in their own time. Uh, and the other thing is that we are running this again later on this afternoon. Um, you could watch it again if you're that way inclined, I uh, doubt it, or you could refer some other people to look at it. Um, uh, and that's why I said we have a question. This interface is not the best, but yes, I can see Vance answered a question. Nick, Nick Oliver, QGIS attribute map export. So we do, so we do have the QGIS and the Putra or Safe might, might chat some answers here as well. Um, there is the QGIS plugin, which you can use to render and IO gas. So whatever you're looking at in gas in the attribute map, if you save that gas file, then there is a QGIS plugin which will re-render that um, 
viewed precisely over in QGIS. And that QGIS plugin is on the website and we keep that up to date. All right, so I think that's it. So I'm going to uh, wrap up the video now. Uh, thanks for your attention, whatever part of the world you're in. And um, I hope to see you on the road somewhere soon at something. Um, so signing off. Cheers, everyone.